Welcome to Vintage SF. I'm Richard Rempel. Today, I have a guest, Bart from Bart's Bookspace. Welcome, Bart. Thank you so much for inviting me, Richard. This is really exciting. Uh, it's exciting for uh, many reasons. One is that I get to meet you via camera, but still, this feels awesome. And the other reason is the subject that we're going to talk about is near and dear to my heart. So thank you for the invite. I'm excited. Let's get into it. All right. I'm going to mention first that there are a couple of videos that I will put in the description and probably pin in a comment from Bart's channel about Stanislav Lem, uh, in particular about The Invincible, but also a great one about Solaris, where he does some background about Stanislav Lem. So I'd like to know a little bit more about Stanislav Lem and your connection to Lem. Okay. Well, I was born in Poland. Lem, of course, is one of the most famous Polish authors, so the connection is obvious. I love science fiction, and Lem is one of the greatest science fiction authors, uh, in my opinion, uh, of all time. I think most people would agree uh, that he offers a lot. Of course, Lem wrote in Polish, and we'll talk probably a little bit about the difficulties with translating a language that's quite different from, from English. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, my interest in Lem dates back to when I was uh, maybe a teenager, maybe 15, 16 is when I picked up my first Lem book. And, uh, and something there definitely captured my attention. Also, the fact that I was able to read them in the original Polish made a big difference. Lem has a fantastic way of writing uh, that I don't think always translates well into English, uh, but reading it in the original Polish was fantastic. And one thing, uh, if we talk about Lem's background, that's worth noting uh, is, um, well, Lem was born in 1921. So uh, uh, it's been over 100 years. He was born in, in the city of Lwów uh, in Poland uh, in 1921. When he was 18, World War II broke out. And that had a huge impact on him. I have a quote from one of his books, his master's voice that he wrote in the 80s. And I think this quote really shows well his state of mind uh, that he carried with him uh, after the experiences of World War II, the things that he went through. Uh, so the quote goes, genius is not so much a light as it is a constant awareness of the surrounding gloom. So he carried that gloom with him. His, uh, I guess this, this quote is kind of a flip side of innocence is bliss. You know, if you think of innocence, uh, not uh, ignorance, I'm sorry, ignorance is bliss. Uh, he kind of thought that having awareness, having a genius um, is difficult sometimes because you're aware of, of the potential and growing up, you know, behind the Iron Curtain during the Cold War times when everybody was afraid of nuclear disaster happening uh, definitely played a big part uh, in him, but also in his writing. So, um, yeah, when World War II broke out, in Poland, he was affected personally by it. He saw a lot of atrocities, death. Um, obviously, so many people died during World War II, but specifically uh, in Poland, especially, he learned of his possible Jewish heritage. He didn't know that he was possibly Jewish until uh, that time when it really affected him. He was kind of brought up Catholic mostly, uh, although he later on was uh, an avid <laughs> atheist, uh, uh, outspoken. I don't know if avid is the right word, but outspoken atheist for for sure um uh, but 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 yeah so um so it's also interesting because it wasn't just the word that affected him um when the war ends in 1945 uh it ends for most of the world but for poland and some other countries it doesn't really end because poland becomes a satellite of the soviet union and in fact the city where he was born and lived his whole life is now annexed by the russians by now soviet Union. So he is forced to move or live in the Soviet Union. So he moves from Lvov to Krakow. Krakow is a city in Poland, a beautiful city. I visited with my family a couple of years ago. Amazing medieval city. So it's a good place to live, but still having to, you know, kind of move from the city where you were born and lived and your family had a house and his father was uh, in, in, a doctor. Uh, was definitely difficult, and that trip, you know, to Krakow with many other refugees was also tough. All these things that he saw as in those formative years as a teenager and young man definitely played a huge um, part in his later uh, writing. So, uh, if we're talking about Lem, now after the war, when he settles in Krakow, uh, his father wants him to be a doctor, so he actually studies medicine. He was 
he was considered a genius. His IQ supposedly was above 180, uh, which puts him kind of at top of, I, I don't know who measures these things, uh, but top of any poll in the history, I'm, I'm along with like Copernicus uh, and Maria Curie Skłodowska. Uh, so he is definitely, uh, he's definitely super smart. He passes, of course, uh, the medical school with flying colors, but he decides not to take the test because he wants to write. He doesn't want to be a doctor. He knows if he passes the test, then he's kind of stuck being a doctor. Helping people is a noble profession. He, you know, he thinks, but he wants to write. He has something to say. So he decides, uh, you know, I'm going to be an author. I'm going to write. But this is Poland now behind the Iron Curtain with censorship being part of everyday life, especially at that time. This was the Stalin era. So, uh, so he thinks, well, I have a lot to say but the censors are gonna put a skew on everything. So maybe if I'm writing science fiction, it's gonna make things a little bit easier. Science fiction is kind of looked at as, you know, a lesser thing. Maybe the censorship is not gonna be as strong. Uh, uh, so he publishes his first science fiction book in 1951. Uh, he publishes a book called Astronauti, The Astronauts. But unfortunately, uh, that book uh, has to include a ton of communist propaganda. Uh, so he is a little bit distraught about that. Uh, but he's happy that he published something. Um, and then a few years, few years, few years later, things get a little bit easier. 1953, Stalin dies. A uh, few years later, there's what's called Polish October uh, in 56. And then there's like a thaw. Things are a little bit easier. There's more freedoms introduced. And now his best writing time begins when he writes next 15 years, when he writes most of his you know, like Solaris, like Star Diaries, like Futurological Congress, like his master's books, all these books that come out, uh, Tales of Pierce the Pilot, uh, you know, all these books come out in that time when he has the freedom to write. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a little bit of a background, I think, on Lem. Um, uh, he, he, he dies in 2006. Let's talk a little bit about Invincible right now. Uh, okay. When I was when I was looking at Invincible, I started with this copy right here. It's uh, from the A Science Fiction Special Series uh, yeah. 2. I love and that cover. I, that yeah, this to me is the best cover. There's yeah. a lot of great covers, actually. I have a crappy cover I'll show. This is, this is maybe the worst cover of any, any, any book that I have. It's, this is an old book. I'll tell you how books were printed in Poland back then. You'd get a book like this. You'd pick it up. You'd pay good money. People didn't make a lot of money. In Poland back then and then you'd open up and you'd be reading and you're like oh my gosh this is so interesting and then you'd open to the next page and there was nothing on it nothing printed and this isn't like this is a bit chapter and no this is just nothing on it oh yeah well I have other copies but this copy the one I had in you I'm in New York by the way in my office for those uh, who don't know so uh, um, I'm limited on my uh, lamb collection here that I could show up so all I had here in New York was this old uh, copy that's missing quite a few pages if you go to his one of his videos he shows his stack of lem books and so you can check that out yeah that's, so anyways that's i perfect. i got another one because this one was a translation of a german translation of the polish translation it's interesting. and yeah i was thinking to myself that doesn't necessarily sound like it might be the best reading experience for the invincible so I went to this newer copy, which I know I've seen you have in, in the video. I think you read that in the yes. last year or so. Yes. And it's by Bill Johnston, and it was done MIT Press. Uh, I think the copyright is 2014, but the translation is 2006. Yeah, and that's this a direct one here, from Polish to English. That's right, directly. And uh, so the German one, I think, you know what, I was doing some comparisons after I finished reading the book here. The uh -huh. German one, I think, perhaps was a really good translation. Its title was Der Unspezeigbare. And the reason I think it may have been a really good translation is, surprisingly, this English translation matches up fairly well. It okay. reads more like an older science fiction novel. This one kind of reads like a contemporary science fiction novel. So I think there's a little bit of change in language that way. But I was very surprised. Um, Interesting. Yeah. But what I wanted to know is in one of your videos, you say, if you want to read Lemmy, you really should learn Polish. <laughs> that was a joke. I was, I was being facetious because I said that because Polish is, 
arguably the most difficult language to learn. There are people who will say, no, 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 it's Chinese. There, Hungarian is a tricky one because it sounds like nothing else. Uh, but Polish is pretty much always up there. So I only said it as a joke. There's some excellent translations now. But I think there's something serious about it because uh, the question I want to ask you is, how does Lem use prose in ways that English can't translate? Because there's a lot of beautiful passages in here. There's a, a lot of amazing battle scenes in this book. And I wonder if I could read Polish, what that experience would be like compared to the English experience. Hmm. Well, that's that, that's definitely uh, uh, an interesting question since we're talking about translations in general. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you. Um, I, I mean, I obviously I feel that reading in the original uh, language of any author is superior to any translation, even even a good one. There's just something that um, uh, that that the original language possesses a certain feel uh, uh, that that a translation uh, has always difficulty in capturing. I would imagine, um, but I think specifically with Lem, that may be even more tricky because of the use of neo neologisms. I think they're called uh, words that he invented. But he invents these, and he invents tons of new words um, in, all, in his books. And these words are very um, intricately put together from the Polish language, from associations, from different words. And they're beautiful. They're amazing. They're thought-provoking in itself. So you, you're reading, and then this word comes up, and, like, and you think about it. Uh, so those things can be done better or worse, if um, depending on a translator. And I haven't really, you know, dove too deeply into the translations. Like I read The Invincible in Polish years ago. I looked at it uh, yesterday before a conversation again, uh, reading some time ago about uh, he's very popular in China now. Uh, and it's because of the recent translations that they did from Polish into Chinese. Uh, and I listened to one of the Chinese translate, like, translators from Polish who's speaking, and she was saying uh, that uh, she felt that translating Lem uh, is an intellectual puzzle for her um, because of the, the language that he uses and how to translate that uh, into, into Chinese in, in her case. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so it's, it, I think it would be amazing uh, if, uh, if mo more people could read Lem uh, in his or original voice, but uh, alas, it is what it is. And I think we do have some options now also with translations. Interesting thing I'll say, the Chinese, previous Chinese translations were four removes, so four. So imagine they had, there was the original Polish, then I think they had from Polish to, uh, to German, then there was the English translation, which you're talking about, for example, for Invincible, and then they were using that English translation to translate into Chinese. So it was Polish to German to English, then to Chinese. So that's, you know, the removal. Uh, and it's kind of like uh, like that game of, you know, uh, it's it just a lot is lost in translation when you're doing it that way. So. Uh, so, yeah, I'm glad I'm glad Lem is uh, talked about uh, and uh, and and translated and read widely right now, still, even though he passed away, um, you know, almost 20 years ago. So let's talk a little bit about Invincible itself here. So, yeah, we can talk about it. Uh, I mean, you read it more recent. It sounds like you read it twice with the two different translations. Um, well, but I compared. I didn't read the whole book. In a okay, okay, okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. So uh, is Invincible is a story. Invincible, first of all, is the name of a ship. Uh, it's a ship called Invincible, class A, like huge, powerful ship. Uh, it also is <clears throat> kind of a synonym for humanity, how we feel about ourselves at times. Uh, that we're invincible, that the whole world, the universe belongs to us. Colonialism is a theme, I suppose, uh, here. Uh, and this ship uh, is sent to a planet. I think the planet is called Regis III. Um, it's, uh, this, this ship is sent to a planet called Regis III uh, because a previous ship that landed there, Condor, uh, disappeared. No one has heard from them, from the crew. So, uh, so Invincible is sent to this planet uh, and um, lands on the planet. And then the story starts. Um, Adam, are we going into spoilers? Is is that okay? Or what 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 is your framework for? I think I we want to entice people to read this novel, and I'd like to talk about some of the themes. And when we yes. talk about some of the themes, I probably will put some sort of a spoiler alert there. Okay. Um, but I think if we talk in general about the themes, then we don't wreck the plot of the right. book. 
that that makes perfect sense. So it's a, it's a book. Um, the, the story begins once they land on this planet and, uh, uh, and and they start to figure out what happened to the previous ship. What is this planet all about? There's some mysteries uh, that this planet has that are apparent. Um, no spoilers here, but for example, there is life in the oceans, but zero flora or fauna on land. Why did that happen? It's inconceivable that over millennia of evolution that nothing evolved uh, and crossed. We know how many times life has gone back and forth on our planet. Um, so, so they're they're looking at that, uh, and um, and well, there there are lots of lots of things in this book um, to talk about. Certainly, uh, there are some new things that Lem kind of invents, comes up with. Um, uh, for sure, the, the big one really is, it's called necroevolution. And this is a huge theme in the book. Um, and Before uh, we get to that, uh -huh. I'm just going to highlight a couple other things in the story, I think. And then Go we'll ahead. get to that as a, a concept. So uh, in taking a look at the story, they land on that planet. I feel like there is an, there's an intense feeling to this book. Uh -huh. uh, there's this mystery of what has happened to the crew of the Condor. They have to find the Condor. Uh, they're on a desert planet, but it has an ocean teeming with life, but there's no life on the planet, as you mentioned. And they're starting to explore. And this ship is huge. It's got all kinds of machinery in there. It has yeah. things that are like drones, which is amazing for a book written in 1964 or published in 1964. Yeah. And like battle tanks and and unbelievable equipment in here there this this ship is equipped to try to face anything that they find on a planet yeah. and so we get into a mystery what has happened to the condor and then we also find that there may have been another uh intelligence on this planet and that's where we're going to be getting into what you were going to talk about there i don't think i really want to go into the plot too much further Okay. Other than to say there's mystery, there's incredible technology predicted yeah. 60 years ago, and philosophy, and there's a beauty. To me, it was a beauty in the writing and description of the planet, of the force fields around the ship, uh, rain hitting the force field, some beautiful images, and it's, it's quite a trip. And, and as I said, there's very uh, amazing battle sequences in here, too. So you get an idea that there's something going on here. Uh, it gives me a little bit of the feel even of The Thing, the movie The Thing that was based on John W. Campbell's Who Goes There. Sure. Uh, it's not the exact concept, but just that tension, that feel of mystery and trying to understand something that seems is beyond our own understanding. So I think this is where, especially the spoiler, let's talk a little bit about the technology that is this alien intelligence that they come across. And you might want to just skip to the end of this video or else, you know, I'm going to just say this is an amazing novel, well worth reading. <laughs> uh, different ways they talk about this technology. I just have some notes here. Sure. Um, they... They talk about it as um, autonomous self-replicating machines, clouds or swarms of uh, microbots. Yeah. And they, if sometimes if you think of starlings and how they can sort of form swarms and shapes, that's kind of what I picture these robots are like on the surface of this planet. And it's supposed that they came from another planet and the reason that there is evolutionary chaos on this planet is because this these machines uh, lost their biological creators, but yes. they have created, they have become an evolution to themselves. And this is, I think, what you were starting to talk about. So I'll just pitch it over to you. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is, uh, and the wholly original idea that Lem had, this not necro, necro evolution, right? The idea of necro evolution, evolution of machines, of non living beings. We only think of evolution as organic life can evolve uh, to better get it, uh, adjusted to its environment. No one up to that point has thought of machines 
uh, advanced machines, of course, but uh, machines nevertheless, dead beings evolving. And um, so there's a whole backstory in this book that's kind of hinted at that would be an amazing story because it's a story of this uh, of beings from another planet. Um, we don't know if they're humanoid in shape or what kind of aliens they are, but they know the sun is going to go supernova. Uh, their star is going to go supernova and they need to find another planet. So they ship themselves with all their technology, but along the way somewhere they just perish, you know, uh, in the space and depths of space. and the ship lands on the planet. And now these machines, you know, are on the planet with no, like you said, with no biological overlords. And they start to evolve. They start to evolve to, to the new environment. And they start to, uh, they start to slowly take over the environment. Also, that is the reason why there is no life on Earth. And the only life, not, not on Earth, but on Regis, the only life that exists is in the water because these machines have evolved so well as to kind of control the planet at this point. And there's also another hint at this huge war that took place between machines, machines that were big and this nanotechnology. And it turns out that the more simple life forms or death forms in this case survived. And these machines are the cities. If you remember at one point, they go into this place where it looks like they're cities, but these were machines who have lost uh, this, this bar. So I just, I, the ideas that, um, that he presents in this book, each one you could kind of think about and have your mind blown. I was thinking uh, last night when I was kind of thinking about this book, about the idea of necro evolution, uh, self evolution of, of, of dead, dead beings, of, uh, of, of beings who, are, who do not have consciousness, because it's clear that these beings are not conscious. Um, and uh, and just, just an amazing story. And also the realization of the main character, Rohan, I think is his name in this book, when he, when he realizes that we are fighting these beings uh for no reason it's 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 akin to fighting uh a, you know a hurricane you wouldn't be upset at a hurricane for 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 killing your it's it's an act of nature uh it's just so many things to in this book uh to to i think think about um it's 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 pretty deep and 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 i think i think there are few ideas that each one could have been expanded into a into a book on its own but to have them all in one book I think is uh, pretty awesome. And I think it's really interesting because I think there is a, a, a type of intelligence, a type of swarm intelligence, almost like the together. individual bots when they come together are like neurons of a brain. Yes. Um, but it's also very instinctive in terms of what they're doing. Yes. Um, so there's a, an intelligence, but an instinct there. And it's, it's fascinating that in yeah. 1964, when computers were the size of a room, that he yeah. could imagine these things. I that blew me away about Lem, just his technological imagination. And then you know I don't think the characters were fleshed out in a lot of ways, but I started to care for Rowan or Rowan, yeah, uh, and his plight and his circumstances with other crew members who uh, were lost or 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 could be killed, yeah. and. There's a dilemma that the captain of the ship puts him into oh, yeah. that really kind that of was very interesting, um, very interesting it me to care about them. Yeah. And so uh, I, I know that it, some people might find it dry, but uh, by the time I got to the end of the book, I was wholly into it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I feel I feel exactly the same way. I think I think even though there, uh, there are many, many themes, this book does not forget about humans. Uh, I mean, they're not the most important, like character-wise, character development, it, not much, non-existent. They all kind of seem similar in some ways, except for the for the captain, I suppose, and Rohan. Um, but at the same time, the decisions that they have to make uh, and the realizations uh, that they come to uh, are very interesting and very telling, and uh, uh, and maybe optimistic in a way. Uh, I think I think uh, Lem is showing our faults to us in this book our uh, pride uh, in some ways, our, our just grandeur of, of thinking. Um, and of course, uh, of course, of course, we get punished for that. Uh, but, uh, but I think we learn something from it as well. I think it's a, I think it's an interesting book and it's short. It's like less than 200 pages in my edition and it packs a lot. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a great book. I think maybe we should, uh, 
talk about one other theme and then maybe we'll start to wrap up. Yeah. Uh, there is so much to talk about in this book. We probably oh, could yeah. do a couple videos about it. But uh, the question I have is who or what is truly invincible? There, there seems to be some ideas. You know what, I'll, maybe I'll let you talk about it and then I'll respond to that. But who, are, who in this book or what is truly invincible or are we fooling ourselves about being invincible? Um, yeah, I, I wonder. I wonder where that um, it comes from. I, I think, I think, I think perhaps Lem was attacking. Maybe I'm projecting because I don't know this for sure. Uh, but maybe he was attacking religion a little bit here, uh, because there are themes in religion. Poland at uh, the time and still is right now is very much a Catholic uh, country. Um, I, that's how I grew up as well. Uh, and and but but in um, in religion. Uh, there is uh, the I think most religions and uh, maybe Buddhism is a little bit different but but there is the feeling of, that we're special right uh, people who grow up uh, strongly believing that they're special that they're saved that uh, they're the chosen ones whatever the term may be uh, may have a certain mentality and obviously uh, Lamb being an atheist had uh, a little bit of a different view on it uh, and the completely different view when it comes to the cosmic scale um, uh, and, 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 and I think uh, he was possibly trying to show that this uh, aura of invincibility or sp being special, uh, there, is a, there is a point in this book where, where the main, uh, main character uh, is, is thinking about what's going on. Uh, and he says to himself, not everything everywhere is for us. Uh, and I think that was a powerful quote. Not everything everywhere is for us. Um, and it's it's simple, um, but it isn't obvious, right? If we talk about colonialism, if we talk about the way nationalism uh, plays still a part in, in in our thinking, this is some of the things uh, that I think um, Lem was uh, wary about, and and he was seeing in the world with that first quote that I in the beginning of the video I gave about the gloom, you know, that that he was seeing, uh, that you know, being intelligent, being smart, being a genius is not. It's not a light it's it's a burden you know because so um so i think i think i think that uh, that has a lot to do with it mm, uh, and invincibility and, and the ship and the human mentality uh, is, uh, is 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 on display here i think but there is a lesson and i think i think it's well wrapped up uh, and um, and there is a little bit of optimism also uh, at the end of this book uh, in my opinion uh, that uh, things can be different. We can be at peace. Uh, we can uh, discover other places without, you know, necessarily taking over, affecting, uh, feeling as if we have the right to uh, dominate using the the Cyclops. I think it was the machine that they rolled out and tried to kill the swarm, and then that the antimatter machine, like whatever, uh, <laughs> that, that, that we decided to use on this swarm, which is basically a hurricane, a, a thunderstorm. It's you know, it's, it's no different. So yeah, fascinating for sure. And I would agree in, in about uh, this is kind of a myopic, short-sighted uh, entitlement that yeah. we, it's on an unconscious bias potentially that the people who are coming to this planet feel. Um, and the ship obviously is named the Invincible and it is not a, it's, it, it almost hits you on the head with it. Yeah. But it is a really good way to focus what's going on here. And you try and you start to realize maybe these guys really aren't invincible. Maybe there's uh, life, not even biological, that we really can't communicate with or understand. And should we even be there? Should we back up and say, this is theirs? We yeah. shouldn't even be here. And that's kind of the question that you come to at the end of the novel. And uh, yeah, well, I think, I think what what you said there is is, is really another uh, one of those uh, amazing amazing themes that Lem brings back. And when you read Solaris, it's a recurrent theme. It comes up. Actually, Solaris was written uh, before this book, so Solaris was was first. But also about this uh, this 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 contact and the idea of. Uh, of not being able to communicate uh, with uh, with a strange, strange uh, alien being, uh, something that he was thinking about, and also he was thinking about does uh, 
uh, contact equal necessarily conflict, uh, or can it be uh, can it be something else? So these were the the themes that he was definitely you know working on, um, and is on display in Solaris, um, you know, but also but also here. Valuable conversations that we still need yeah. today. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you wanna? I think I'm sorry. Go ahead. So do you want to give a sort of a wrap up, maybe uh, your recommendation for this book? Yeah, well, I, I definitely recommend reading this book. It's not my favorite necessarily, Lem, but I think it's an awesome, awesome read. Uh, I, I like every single book that I read by Lem, uh, I enjoyed. Um, so I recommend you read Lem. Not every one of his books is going to hit for you, uh, but I think many... I think you can't go wrong with uh, with with Lem, and I'm hoping more people decide to uh, you know to pick up his books uh, and read them. You know, he is uh, he never won a uh, Nobel uh, Prize, but in Poland uh, he is you know valued as one of the greatest authors that uh, we've in our thousand years over thousand years of history have ever produced. You know, along with uh, in the same vein with with many. Uh, people who have won the Nobel in literature like uh, Szymborska, Miłosz and Tokarczuk recently uh, and Szymkiewicz and Joseph Conrad who wrote in English and is thought as the, the, one of the greatest English uh, authors but was, of course Polish, was born in Poland, lived in Poland, didn't speak English until he was 20 and became the greatest English author uh, ever. So, um, you know, so he is in line with those types of people and maybe also Sapkowski is probably the most famous right now because of the Vyajmin uh, Witcher series. So Sapkowski is a uh, huge name. So Lem is along with them. 2000, uh, tw in 2021, uh, Poland celebrated his 100-year one, birth anniversary uh, with the year of Lem. So he is, uh, you know, a major player uh, in science fiction, huge figure in Poland. And I have a suspicion that if he was born in the U.S. or England or Canada, the point being if he was writing in English, he would have been uh, possibly, possibly above a uh, couple of the guys on the big three, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and um, so, definitely worth, explo worth exploring and finding out if, if Lem works for you. Well, you know, I came back to science fiction over the last few years. I read it when I was younger. Same. Never heard of Lem. Never heard of him. Mm. And so, uh, I'm discovering some amazing world authors that I've missed in the past. And so I was very excited in reading this book and I'll be very excited when I get to Solaris next. This book here, I give it for myself an 8.5 out of 10. The ideas, the themes, the time it was written and uh, even the conflict, it was, it was, it was very, very gripping. And uh, you can see I'm, a, I'm excited about it too. So if you haven't heard of Lem or haven't read Lem, uh, there's a lot of good literature out there to discover. So I want to thank you, Bart, for joining me. Uh, well, been, this has been great. It's so good to have uh, the viewpoint of a person who is from Lem's country and has read Lem in the Polish. Yeah. Uh, I think that's been really valuable for our viewers. So thank you I again. I hope so. I hope I wasn't selling him too hard, <laughs> but I, I do love Lem uh, and I love science fiction and it's been a pleasure visiting with you on your channel. Thank you so much for this invitation. Uh, maybe we'll get to do it again sometime, uh, talk about another book. Uh, I'm always excited uh, to talk sci-fi with, uh, uh, with fellow booktubers. So this is awesome. Thank you, Richard. You're welcome. And make sure you get to Bart's book space. There's a lot of good stuff there. <laughs> All right. Take care, Bart. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. So what are your thoughts about Stanislav Lem? Have you read The Invincible? Let Bart and I know in the comments below. As always, keep reading.